Hello, you're watching the India story with me, Vikram Chandra. And it's a lot to talk about this week. The Israeli offensive on Gaza continues, and it is continuing to have a major impact on the entire world and on India as well. Because let's face it, the Middle East and West Asia has been a very important strategic area for India. Lots of relationships being nurtured out there. And now it's a very, very tough tightrope walk that India is having to walk in that particular region. And then, of course, there are the broader questions for the entire world, not least a humanitarian catastrophe that seems to be unfolding right now in the Gaza Strip. So we're going to talk about that at some length today on the India story. We're also going to turn our attention to other issues, a potential data leak that has caused concerns once again around Aadhaar, although many experts are saying that that's not necessarily uh, where, where, where the problem is. The Aadhaar database itself is secure, but we're going to be talking about that and the allegations of snooping after Apple sent notifications to many people, many of whom were opposition leaders. We're also going to be taking a look at the other major headlines that we should be tracking, not least the question of air pollution. North India once again is breathing poison, toxic air. Just take a look at the images from outside where I'm speaking to you. It looks like a gas chamber out there and actually it is. Air pollution one of those major issues that damages and dampens the India story every year at this time. Now, you could say it's a Delhi problem or an NCR problem, but it's not. It's a North India problem, and we better find something about it. So before I come to Israel or Gaza or Slooping, here's a quick look at the major headlines. Delhi's air quality plummeted to the severe plus category on November 3rd morning a stage at which all emergency measures, including a ban on polluting trucks, commercial four-wheelers and all types of construction are mandated to be enforced in the national capital region. The city's air quality index skyrocketed from 351 at 10 a.m. on November 2nd to 471 at 9 a.m. on November 3rd. According to Centre's Graded Response Action Plan for Pollution on Air Quality Index of above 450 is Severe Plus category. The Enforcement Directorate reportedly conducted fresh searches on November 3rd in pole-bound Rajasthan as part of its money laundering investigation into the alleged Jaljeevan mission scam. Raids were conducted at 25 premises in the state capital Jaipur and Dosa. Rajasthan Chief Minister Ashok Gehlot has alleged that the central agencies were acting on the directions of BJP-led government at the centre to target the opposition, with the state going to polls on November 25th. And in cricket, India secured a semi-final spot after thrashing Sri Lanka in Cricket World Cup in Mumbai on November 2nd by 302 runs. Sri Lanka crumbled for a paltry 55 in 19.4 overs to ensure an eighth semi-final appearance for India at the global event. This was India's biggest victory by margin of runs. All right, let me start with the situation in the Gaza Strip as the Israeli ground offensive now seems to be moving into some sort of top gear. And I know we're spending a lot of time on the India story, looking at what's happening between Israel and Gaza, but it's important that we actually do so. One, of course, there's the humanitarian impact of all that has happened there, the terror attacks, brutal as they were. Now the humanitarian catastrophe that's happening in Gaza, images like this are very much dominant and should be dominant in all of our minds. But also, when it comes to India and the India story, there's a very important reason why whatever unfolds there is going to be of critical importance. Let's take a look at India's strategic ambitions for many years. They've had a lot to do with the Middle East. Remember, China has been building out that BRI and talking about its own connectivity with the rest of the world. For India, a lot of the strategic paths to the world have gone through the Middle East. Remember IMEC, there was so much being spoken about that just a short while back. There was a hope that there would be a corridor running from Saudi Arabia, UAE, of course, a close ally of India, going into Israel, perhaps going on to Europe. All of that 
is under some question now. And it will be more under question if this sort of death and devastation and havoc continues to unfold in the Middle East. So today on the India story, we're going to be broadening our focus a little bit. What's happening right now? Yes. But what's likely to happen in the middle term? Is there likely to be peace? What will that peace be? And how should all of this affect India and Indian policy towards the world? So we've got a range of experts taking us through various aspects of this very complex dynamic. And I'm going to start with the Palestinian ambassador to India. Last week, we were speaking to the Israeli ambassador of India. Now we're being joined by the Palestinian ambassador to India. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, just wanted to hear from you. What is the latest that you're ha hearing on the humanitarian situation uh, inside Gaza and also on how the Israeli offensive on Hamas is actually poised right now? Let me say that you can imagine 28 days without water, without electricity, without medicine, without uh, <clears throat> fuel, without uh, oxygen. So the situation is uh, horrible in uh, Gaza Strip. We have lost up to now, now uh, 9,000 have been, more than 9,000 have been registered and we, there is 2,000 under the building Debris. Uh, there is more than 25,000 injured. Uh, on Wednesday, there was three massacres. One in Jabalia, maybe you have noticed that, how many uh, people have been killed. Another one in uh, Libreage refugee camp and another one in the same day in Ashat refugee camp. Yesterday there was another massacre in uh, uh, Jabalia refugee camp also. Right. So, uh, Your Excellency, we know that the Israeli ground forces are there in Gaza and the Israelis are clear that they are not going to stop until Hamas is actually destroyed. Um, what, you, what are you being able to pick up from your sources? How strong is Hamas in there? And do you think this, uh, it'll be possible for the Israeli ground forces to defeat Hamas in, the, in a short period of time? Let's say that Hamas is not just a man and a gun. Hamas is an idea, Hamas is ideology. So Hamas is not those few people who are having their gun. I think uh, for the Israelis, it's uh, very difficult. According to their officers, we are looking for ceasefire. We don't know. We don't want that war to be continued. Uh, we want to live in peace. We want the international community to work hard for the two-state solution, for peaceful uh, uh, political uh, peaceful solution. And to end all these crises, I think both the Israelis and the Palestinians have fed up of war. I just but wanted to ask you that question then, because, you know, once whatever unfolds in the Gaza Strip, let's say Israel is able, is, is able to crush the Hamas, uh, you know, fighting machinery in the tunnels and the rest of it, a lot of people are wondering what comes next. And do you think it is possible that once the fighting ends, there will actually be international pressure to move towards a long-term solution, you know, an end to the settlements, a two-state solution, some formula by which a lasting peace can come. If it comes to the, uh, this extreme government, they want to evacuate our people from West Bank to Egypt, from uh, Gaza Strip to, to Egypt, and from West Bank to Jordan. So they don't ever thought about peace. Since we have uh, signed Oslo Accord, they are destroying, killing uh, this uh, accord when they killed Mr. Ishaq Rabin. Those extreme government who killed Ishaq Rabin, those extreme settlers who killed Ishaq Rabin. And uh, since that time, they are destroying the two-state solution via confiscating land, building settlements every day, killing people, jailing people, uh, we have heard more than one time Mr. Netanyahu when he said that he will make the life as a hell till they leave the land. We are not leaving the land. I just wanted to ask you a question. You know, in, let us say there is the end to Hamas. A lot, a, a lot of the Israelis, uh, you know, there's a lot of people wondering 
what will happen to fill the vacuum that will be there? Um, I'm not sure whether Israel wants to continue to occupy the Gaza Strip directly. The international community is clearly saying they should not do that. They need to withdraw. Somebody will have to take that place, fill up the vacuum left by Hamas, assuming Hamas is destroyed. Do you think the Palestinian Authority would be willing to go into Gaza and say, OK, we will run it? Sure not. Sure not. It's, I mean, we have only one thing. With Hamas itself, we should find a peaceful solution, right, and go by the pressure of the international community to implement Israel to come to the two-state solution according to the uh, international law and uh, international resolutions from the United Nations. After that, election will be in Palestine, and we will live in peace with the Israelis. But you but, Your Excellency, Israel says Hamas is responsible for one of the worst terror attacks in living, in living memory. You know, 1,300, 1,400 Israelis died. Israel is obviously not wanting to talk to or negotiate with Hamas right now. So is there any way that negotiations can happen, happen without Hamas on the table? Let me say, first of all, who is the terrorist is the occupation itself. And how many one have killed just... We, with the last two, uh, 20 years old, those terrorists who consider Hamas a terrorist organization now, right? Hamas, at least, they are fighting for liberation. They have been sieged for 17 years. Uh, you know, the life of, of the people with 70 uh, poverty in Gaza Strip, they can't move from Gaza Strip anywhere. The staff of my embassy, they are from Gaza. They can't go to Gaza because they're afraid they can't come back to India. All the students, Palestinian students, uh, during the COVID, no one leave India to uh, Gaza because they thought that they can't come back to India to continue their studies. This was the life of our people in Gaza. So the terrorist is the occupation itself. Uh, move the occupation. Find a peaceful solution. Hamas will be there uh, as a political party, and all the Palestinian people. Hamas the was world. Hamas was there as a political party till it went across and you know killed 1,300 people. So in a sense, by carrying out that act of terror, Hamas has lost itself the right to be there on, a, on any negotiating table. Wouldn't you agree with that view? I mean, wouldn't you why condemn you are, the terror attack that happened? Why you insist about that? Why you insist while thousands of thousands, you, you remember how many thousand Israelis killed in Gaza in 2008 and in 2014 and, uh, and 2012, 2021, and this time? Why Hamas is terrorist? Why the Israelis are democratic country? It, they are, look, to me, I compare Gaza Strip as Leningrad and the Nazist army who is sieging Gaza Strip. These crimes, it's ex exactly or more than the Nazist army has been done uh, before the, uh, uh, during the Second World War. So why we insist Hamas is a terrorist? The terrorist is the occupation. In the occupation, there is no Fatah, no PLO, no, that it will be Palestine state, and we will live, live in peace. Those from 1948 have committed more than 56 massacres, thousands of thousands of the Palestinian people, thousands in the prisons, confiscating land every day, uprooting our trees every day, demolishing our houses every day, killing our children every day. Do you know before yes. 7th of September, the Israelis killed 260 people from the beginning of this year. From 7th of November till now, they have killed 140 people. Yep. I'm talking about West Bank, not, not in Gaza. All right. Your right. Excellency, just wanted to ask you one, one, one last question on the, on the question of the humanitarian situation in Gaza. A lot of people across the world are obviously wanting to help in some manner. They're seeing the suffering inside Gaza. They're wanting to help. What practical help do you think the world community can do? Obviously, the political situation, the political questions are beyond most people's ability to actually be able to help and assist. What can people do to help the people of Gaza right now who are suffering, the innocent people? The innocent people, the 
who call them democratic countries all around the world, including the United States, should make a pressure at the Israelis because we have thousands of thousands of tons of humanitarian uh, aid in Egypt now. You, do you know Gaza Strip normally uh, before 7th of, of uh, October there was every day to supply Gaza there was uh, 500 trucks every day from 21st of October till now there was till yesterday 340 trucks do you know what that means the water entered to the people in Gaza is 50 millimeter of water for each one in Gaza while 10 kg uh, of explosive have been thrown uh, to the uh, right for each one in Gaza according to the Euro Mediterranean Human Rights Monitor. Your Excellency, your message is loud and clear. Thank you so much, uh, His Excellency Adnan Abu Al Haija, the Palestinian ambassador to India. Thank you so much for joining us with that perspective. Thank you, Mr. Vakram. Thank you. Thank you. So clearly a lot of anger there, a lot of anguish out there, and there's a lot of anger and a lot of anguish in Israel as well after that terror attack on the 7th of October. I think we have to step back a little bit and see where is the end game in all of this? What is going to happen? What happens if Israel is successful in rooting out Hamas there in Gaza? What if it's not? Where does this all lead to? Will there be peace at some point. How should countries like India make their strategic plans on the basis of this? Joining us now to answer some of those questions, Alan Burstein, who's an uh, Israel Institute fellow at the University of uh, Cali California. Uh, Alan, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, obviously a lot of anger there in Israel, anger, of course, in, in the Gaza Strip. Is there some sort of an end game in all of this? Where does this, where does this, this possibly lead to? One month, three months, six months from now? There's a reported endgame. I cannot say that it is a realistic one. Israel has said that it is not going to return to the reality that has been. Hamas has controlled the Gaza Strip since 2007, and Israel has carried out over 10 major operations against the Gaza Strip whenever rockets were attacked. It carried out two large-scale invasions. But every time it carried out the invasion, and then it came back and said, and now we're okay, now they're deterred. Now it's going to be more calm. And that sort of blew up in Israel's face on October 7th. So now Israel's saying it's not going to return to that. It's going to go in and destroy Hamas that they cannot govern anymore. Realistically, what does that mean? No one really knows. And there's mounting pressure in the United States also that Israel does not really have a plan for what happens after. Let's say they reoccupy the Gaza Strip and destroy Hamas. What's next after you've killed most Hamas fighters? No one really knows. Okay, so before we move to the medium and the long-term implications of whatever is happening, let's just try and understand this in the short term. Look, Gaza is not a very big place. What, 25 miles by 4 miles, 2.2 million people crammed into that small area. So when Israel is saying destroy Hamas, how is it going to be possible to physically destroy Hamas without there actually being a very, very large number of casualties? It depends what they mean by destroy Hamas. You're absolutely right. The whole Gaza Strip is 161 square miles or 363 square kilometers. It is an absolutely tiny region. And just for some proportion, in the, last, in the first two weeks of the war, Israel dropped more bombs into the Gaza Strip than the United States dropped into all of Afghanistan in two years of war. So realistically, there's no way to really fight an active war there constantly without mass amounts of civilian casualties. Now, Israel has called on civilians in Gaza to move down south, Roughly 1 million civilians are now internally displaced and have moved down south. So it's theoretically trying to, to minimize this. But this is exactly the question the United States is asking. You're going to destroy Hamas. How are you going to do that? Are you going to go house by house and interrogate 2 million people, ask them if they are Hamas members? What exactly does that mean? Right now, it appears to be much more of a desire in Israel to destroy Hamas's military capabilities, which you can do without killing everyone in the Gaza Strip. You can theoretically take over the Gaza Strip and manage to somehow mitigate and control the, the missiles or the guns or something like that. But destroying Hamas as a movement, I, I'm not sure Israel has a plan. I think that's really where everyone is fearful that Israel is just going in without a real plan of what's going to happen. 
so clearly there are short-term questions about whether Hamas can actually be destroyed, but, but let's assume it is done. Let's assume that every single person who is ostensibly a, a member of Hamas or a Hamas supporter is actually quilled. The next question is bound to be, what happens next? How do you prevent Hamas from coming back? Um, are Israeli troops going to remain out there? Is Israel going to remain in occupation of the Gaza Strip and try to run it as they did before 2005, 2006? Is that even feasible? So there's a lot of concern in the U.S. administration that Israel thinks it's going to govern it itself. And that really is a return to direct occupation. And there are even more elements because Israel has in its government very, very right-wing elements that are saying we should even restore settlements and go back to the way it was prior to Israel's evacuation of the Gaza Strip in 2005. Most likely what's going to happen is Israel is going to try to pawn this off onto the Palestinian Authority. It's going to try to say now the Palestinian Authority has to take over, it's going to be their job, and hope. I think that the hope in Israel is that like in the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority will just be a weakened organization that because it's hanging on to power is going to not attack Israel because it wants to just maintain its power. I think that's probably the hope in Israel, but there isn't really a plan. Israel has has proposed already in internal negotiations three different scenarios. So one was a return to direct rule. The other was some sort of regional government. They said maybe it will be uh, Arab governments alongside international forces, alongside Egypt, some mishmash that's unclear because no one would no one, none of these other countries agreed to this. And finally, it was return to the Palestinian Authority, which Israel's right wing government is saying it does not want. Realistically speaking, I think that's probably going to be the only viable possibility. I will say, if if, if I can add, coming from a, a point of view of comparative research, there has never been a time, maybe once or twice in all of history, when a terror group has been destroyed by a state and just stay destroyed. Almost always this only happens if you have some sort of diplomatic or regional peace treaty or something like that, that then, as you said, keeps it down. Otherwise, the idea that it's just going to be destroyed and somehow stay down and not come back, and that millions of Gazans that have lost their homes and thousands of people who have lost their lives are just going to agree to now live in peace with Israel after Israel did this to them is not very realistic. That I agree. So, Aaron, in the long term, is there a solution that arises out of all of them? We keep hearing two-state solution and things like that. Can it be done? Or at the end of the day, it's right now looking as if Saudi Arabia peace is off the table. Abraham Accords are looking in doubt. Countries such as India have invested a lot, hoping that there's going to be peace in the Middle East. That's all looking very, very rocky. At some point, do you think peace comes? Do you think a two-state solution comes or some other formula emerges? that the Middle East settles down? I think that, yes, um, ironically, and very tragically, I'll say that in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, in the history of the way this conflict goes, nothing ever changes without massive eruptions of violence. It's a very unfortunate pattern. But Israel took over the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in 1967 and governed it for 20 years with a harsh occupation and settlements. And it took the first Palestinian Intifada in order to get Israel to sign the Oslo Accords with the Palestinian, with the PLO that created the Palestinian Authority. After that, Jordan signed peace with Israel. After that, all of a sudden, Arab countries that had never agreed to have any relations with Israel started to have them. Then it took the second intifada and a lot of violence to lead Israel to withdraw from the Gaza Strip. Now, I'm not justifying violence. I'm not saying, therefore, this is a good thing. But I am saying that every time there's such a massive eruption of violence, it really changes the geopolitical system and changes the regional alliances in very substantial ways. Now, what, what has happened so far in the last month, more Israelis were killed than in both intifadas combined, and more Palestinians have been killed than in the last 20 years, or I'll say in the last 18 years since the end of the second intifada. So we already have the makings of like that tragic moment when both leaderships are going to look and say, okay, maybe something has changed. And should there be an Israeli leadership and a Palestinian leadership? You said best case scenario, so I'm trying to be optimistic. In the Middle East, that's a challenge. But should there be two sides that are willing to come together, I think a lot of Arab countries would actually like to jump on that because they have their own considerations. Saudi Arabia would love to have relations with Israel in order to have access to a U.S. defense alliance and access to weapons against Iran. 
other countries may want to jump in on that too. I think that they would like that opportunity. But if before, if with the Abraham Accords, Israel and the United States thought they were going to bypass the Palestinian issue and have Israel have relations with the Arab countries, I think this has largely destroyed that option. I think only if a Palestinian authority or entity or whatever is able to make peace with Israel, then Arab countries may follow. I don't see them now being able to say, okay, Israel's now gone and done this in Gaza, we're still going to make peace with it, and we're going to bypass Palestinians. That, I think, would, would be much harder. All right, uh, Aaron Bernstein, that's a very clear outlining of the short term, the medium term, and the long term, and how all of this could potentially play itself out. But let me get another uh, uh, sense on this. Dr. Wael Abad joining us, senior independent journalist. Uh, Dr. Abad, uh, you know, when we are talking about the path forward out of here, all of that, I guess, has to be weighed against the, the images of death and destruction that we are seeing, uh, you know, out of Gaza right now, and the very real anger that there is both in Israel uh, about the October 11, uh, 7 attacks, and also what uh, in, in the Arab world about the death and destruction that we are seeing in Gaza. Thank you, Vikram. I think it's getting more uh, serious and a catastrophe by all the meaning of the word because uh, such a small concentration camp keeping all these people under continuous bombardment. I don't think Hiroshima have received this much of bombs. Neither Ukraine received it, nor Iraq or Afghanistan all throughout the years where the American kept on throwing these bombs. So having said that, I would say the situation is very grim. All hospitals, most of them are out of order. Most of our colleagues who are also, we lost more than 23, 24 journalists. We also losing hospitals, um, uh, schools, everything, every human being moving, uh, people moving from the north to the south are also being attacked. So I think the world, uh, it is a shame on the international community that they are unable to put an end to this uh, human catastrophe. Dr. Awad, as you're speaking to analysts everywhere in the world, what are you picking up? What, for example, are the chances that this is going to broaden, in which case things could get a lot worse very, very fast? We've already had Yemen declaring war on Israel, which is presumably neither here nor there, but do you see this widening? Do you see uh, Egypt or Lebanon or Syria, God forbid, even Iran, getting involved in some way directly in this conflict? I think it's getting out of control. Uh, the amount of killing is so much that even the Arab streets are angry. Even in London, where we are, the people are angry in Europe and the United States. It's not a war. It's just a genocide. So let us uh, find out if this continue. I'm sure this will Let expand. And there is already a skirmish attack on the northern part, uh, uh, south part of Lebanon uh, with Israel forces. And then also we have the uh, Yemeni Houthis are taking part. So that shows the anger in the street, uh, Bikram. And I don't see it as going to stop here because uh, the main objective is to involve uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon and Iran in this war, because we have enough warships in, in the Mediterranean from U.S., from Germany, from France, from England. So everybody join forces, the I mean, within a short notice, but they have not even uh, taken any step to bring peace to the Middle East for the last 75 years. So having said that, I would say that the changing of the, the geopolitical dynamic of this war will be devastated uh, temporarily, uh, I mean, uh, mid uh, 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 impact, and there will be long term impact because investors will have difficulties, there's no stability, so nobody will buy fish in the water. Dr. Abad, one last question. You know, many people here in India are trying to figure out how they should deal with this, what this impact this has on IMEC and those other strategic plans that India has had for West Asia and for the Middle East. What would be your sense and what would be the advice you would be giving to any, any partners you're speaking to here in India? Well, I think India, the, the South Bloc have done their own uh, jobs, whether it was during the war on Syria. I remember Mr. Hardy Puri and the, uh, the permanent representative at the UN, how he was handling the situation. I have done his book also. But the only uh, problem currently is that there are people, I'm sorry to say, but there is no advisor in West Asian affairs to the, to, the, to the Indian government. Therefore, what is being seen at the Arab world now, that India is only discussing uh, maybe part of the Palestinian issue because of Hamas, what they have done. That's fine. We all understand the anger in the world, the global anger and support. That's fine. But I think with India keeping a tight rope and a balance between the two, India has to reach out to most of the Arab capital and act, discuss the India position because it's taken for granted that India is not going to 
you know, sabotage or not, India will, will really uh, walk away from the Palestinian cause because India fought for the freedom, uh, Nelson Mandela for the freedom. It's an apartheid regime which is put, imposing on the Palestinian. So India is a, one of the major powers adhered to the to, to, to international law and UN Charter. So I feel, and my, I, my argument with my, my, my other Arabs where I go in discussion, I said, no, there's nothing changed in Indian position. It just, we need to see it in depth and in analysis. It may be a historical mistake. Some people say that India did not abstain from voting. Well, there are other issues where India can step in to do, to do the, uh, the needful. But I think uh, currently India has to play a major role. And everybody said that India should sideline. That's absolutely wrong. India has to take the lead. India have a stake in the, uh, the, the expatriate living in the Gulf country. You have more than 8 million people there. So you have a revenue of more than $75 billion annually coming from. You have 14 million Indian annually in GCC country. And you have the own security, the food security, and now you are coming with the IMEC, which is the corridor. So why India can't play? I don't understand why India can't tell them, stop this war. We are a democracy. Our people are angry. War should not be the option. Peace should be the strategic option, and let us work for that line. I, I think that's the only position India can take. It's the largest democracy in the world, and they can raise their voice above the, the North Bloc, which is showing so much of anger and refusing even to stop the whole thing, this attack on, on, on Palestine, on Gaza, or West Bank and Jerusalem. If Vikram, it's not only Gaza. It's Jerusalem, is uh, West Bank, where people are suffering. So we have to see what is the main objective. I think little depth, the reading of history, of the conflict and the outcome of it will give us more reasonable and wise approach to the solution, to the problem of two-state solution. At the end of the day, no war, even the American accepted in Iraq and Afghanistan, in Libya and Yemen, that no war can achieve your political objective. So let's go and sit down across the table. Two-state solution is the best and apply the International Union Security Council resolution. And that's all. All right, Dr. Abad, thank you so much for joining us with that view. Thank you. So as you can see, these are complicated, murky waters. India has to walk a very fine tightrope in dealing with all of this, in dealing with the multiple strategic interests, humanitarian interests, and other issues that, of course, the, the government has to keep in mind. And now, of course, there's a fresh twist as well. What is going to happen to Qatar, a country where uh, the Hamas is present, many others are present, and which is now threatening to execute eight former Indian naval officials. So that's yet another concern that Indian policymakers have to now keep in mind. So to help us to navigate the somewhat choppy waters, it's a great pleasure to be speaking to uh, Mr. K.P. Fabian, who's a former Indian ambassador, he was a former Indian ambassador to Qatar as well, also to Italy and many other places, one of our, our, our veteran diplomats. So, uh, Ambassador Fabian, thank you so much uh, for being with us. So these are, these are very difficult. Uh, before I turn to the situation in, 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 in Gaza or, the, or Palestine, you've been ambassador to Qatar, of course, so you understand that country well. What do you make of uh, what, what Qatar has just done by threatening to execute, you know, eight Indians or, or former Navy people? Is it linked to India's stance in Palestine and, and, and uh, uh, Israel in some way, or do you think it is just, just a coincidence? I don't think we can establish or suspect any linkage between India's stance on Palestine and what this death sentence. As you know, they were picked up uh, on the 30th of August 2022, long time ago, okay? So this Palestine, you know, thing started only recently. So there is no linkage. And another thing is that uh, you know, this is the first instance court, okay? And uh, also we should bear in mind that Qatar does not, I repeat, does not have a tradition of uh, carrying out executions. The last execution, I believe according to Amnesty International, was in 2021 of a Nepalese uh, daily wage earner who had knifed to death a Qatari. And before that, it, another execution was 20 years ago. So, in other words, unlike one or two other countries in the region, Qatar does not have a reputation, I mean, a tradition of uh, uh, carrying out executions. And in the present case, I am 
more or less certain, almost convinced that they will not be, I repeat, they will not be executed. All right, that's that's really that's that's a relief to hear, and you of course know that 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 region very well. Um, if you could help us navigate, so India has obviously got multiple strategic relations out there. It's a strategic partner with Israel, very close strategic partnership with the UAE, a fast developing partnership with Saudi Arabia. Um, how does India navigate these waters? I'm sure you must be speaking to many of your, you know, colleagues and former colleagues in, in, in the IFS and others in the government. How do you think India should play the situation, which is, looks as if it's going to get much worse? Well, let me put it this way. In my view, India should deal with Qatar directly rather than go through anyone else. You mentioned Saudi Arabia. Well, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, they don't have good relations. Why? Because Saudi Arabia treats Qatar as a, uh, you know, younger brother who should obey the older brother. And between UAE and Qatar, well, there is some jealousy and rivalry and all that. So let us sort of, you know, leave out uh, others. Let us deal with Qatar directly. And in my view, we have four options. One is to, you know, go through the legal process. As I said, this is a lawyer court. Recently, some years ago, when a Filipino was sentenced to death for espionage, eh? same thing, the Court of Appeal reduced it to life sentence. Okay? In other words, Qatar has a system of uh, delivering justice. If the lower court uh, verdict is too harsh, then there is a higher court. So that's one. Second is diplomatic. When I say diplomatic, well, not only our ambassador, it can also mean a special envoy or even the foreign minister. Okay. Now the third is, well, diplomatic, but at the summit level. In other words, a formal request for pardon should go to the Amir. And uh, after that, at the right time, I repeat my words, at the right time, we should seek a summit meeting after preparing the ground between the Amir and the Prime Minister. The Amir is a younger, young person, is 42, 43, very progressive, and Qatar, which has been sort of, you know, exercising its skills in dispute resolutions, as you know, whether it was between Taliban and the United States or between Iran and the United States. You remember the recent defreezing of $6 billion? And now, of course, the hostages release. So Qatar is not at all interested in spoiling its relations with India, a rising power under Prime Minister Modi's leadership. Right. So we have to handle this carefully. And last option is using other powers, friendly powers, say starting with the United States, putting pressure on Qatar, and if that doesn't work, going to the ICJ. But that option I do not advise at this moment. I think that's very well, that's very clearly laid out, sir, and that's, that's good advice. I was also trying to get your views on the broader situation because the strategic importance of the Middle East has only been building up for India. We've heard so much talk about the IMEC and the economic corridor, how you can build closer relations, you know, with, with Europe, bypass the Chinese BRI. There's a lot that India has at stake there with, with, with the Middle East, with all the Middle Eastern countries. How do you think India should navigate that? Because some of those relationships could be tested in what is happening between Israel and Gaza. Well, in my view, IMAC uh, is uh, not going to happen as fast as we expected, considering what is happening between Israel and Palestine and uh, the position taken by the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Well, I think we have to sort of, you know, keep it uh, on the back burner for the time being. All right, Ambassador Fabian, thank you so much for joining us with that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And let's turn our attention now to another big story, continuing questions around privacy and security. There were a panic which happened in India when there were some reports that Aadhaar details had become uh, publicly available through a, a hack that had taken place somewhere. We're going to be discussing that very shortly. 
But also several opposition leaders made serious allegations against the central government, accusing it of attempting to hack their phone. Several MPs shared screenshots of Apple notifications on social media to back their claims. The ruling BJP dismissed the charges, saying that they are baseless, and the government's also ordered a probe into the entire matter. On October 31st, several prominent opposition party leaders alleged having received a message from tech giant Apple. They were warned of potential state-sponsored attackers attempting to remotely compromise their iPhones. Among them were Congress Chief Malika Arjun Kharge, Shashi Tharoor, Pavan Khera, K.C. Vinugopal, Trinamool Congress MP Mahua Moitra, CPIM General Secretary Sitaram Yachiri, and SP Chief Akhilesh Yadav. पूरे ऑपोजिशन के खिलाफ यहां पे एप्पल का नोटिस आता है मैंने इसको थोड़ा आपके लिए बड़ा करके दिखाया है राइट इसमें लिखा है एप्पल बिलीव्स यू आर बीइंग टारगेटेड बाय स्टेट स्पॉन्सर्स स्पॉन्सर्ड अटैकर्स हु आर ट्राइंग टू रिमोटली कॉम्प्रोमाइज द आईफोन एसोसिएटेड विद योर एप्पल आईडी अब ये मेरे ऑफिस में सब लोगों को मिला है वेनु गोपाल जी को मिला है कांग्रेस पार्टी में लिस्ट बनी हुई है पवन खेड़ा सुप्रिया सीताराम यचूरी अखिलेश यादव प्रियंका चतुर्वेदी महुआ मोहित्रा राघव चड्डा टी एस सिंह देव लिस्ट है इन रिस्पॉन्स द गवर्नमेंट वेहमेंटली डिनाइड दीज एलिगेशन Information Technology Minister Ashwini Vaishnav labeled the charges as baseless, describing the opposition as compulsive critics indulging in the politics of distraction. Meanwhile, Apple clarified its stance, stating that they do not attribute the threat notifications to any specific state-sponsored attacker, and that some of these threat alerts may be false alarms. The controversy isn't new. In 2021, a global investigative journalism initiative revealed that the Pegasus spyware had targeted over 300 mobile phones in India. This included politicians from opposition parties, members of civil society, and journalists. Meanwhile, the government cyber security agency, the Indian Computer Emergency Response Team, announced on 2nd November that they have initiated an investigation on the matter and a notice has been sent to Apple. These allegations come at a crucial time as five states are gearing up for elections in the coming weeks. The general election scheduled for next year. The question being raised is why only members of the opposition parties received these hacking alerts. So you look these concerns about safety about security about whether you should trust your phone or not whether you should trust your data or not these are not issues that are new these are not issues that are going to go away anytime in the near future how do we navigate these waters well joining us arvind gupta head of the digital india foundation we also have with us aship kadiyal a member of the congress party uh, let's just arvind let me start by you of course the immediate uh, provocation for this debate if i can use that word is one fresh charges of snooping but also potential leaks of some aadhar data what is your sense arvind uh, of of these things how safe are we how easy is it for somebody to snoop on your phone um are we making a storm in a teacup where do you think we are so um three uh, points that you raised vikram let me start with number 1 uh categorical we understand that there is no leakage of the aadhar database let me repeat myself there is no leakage of the aadhar database the aadhar database the aadhar numbers that you and me have the 12 digit numbers are seeded in many other systems and sometimes yes these other systems do get compromised uh, through the dark web or through some other malware that they use but let me reiterate the core aadhar system has not been breached uh, so far and we just keep hoping that's the status and this is a this is a chicken and uh, you know a cat and mouse game so we have a lot of national enemies right now 
and uh, and we need to ensure that our, our databases are always secure. Arvind, so let me just problem. ask you, what, what you just said, the Aadhaar database itself is secure, but if other systems which are plugging into Aadhaar, and let's remember the India stack is basically... They don't, they don't, they don't plug into Aadhaar, that's what I'm trying to explain. No system plugs into Aadhaar, but Aadhaar number, if I go and use my Aadhaar number to avail something X, Y, Z, let's say 10 of us are filling out um, admission form and we go and in an Excel sheet, we put in our Aadhaar numbers and that Excel sheet gets compromised. Nothing is affected on the Aadhaar side. It's the Excel sheet that has been compromised that has my name, Arvind Gupta, my, maybe my Aadhaar number and maybe some other details written on it. The Aadhaar system, it has no linkage to the Aadhaar system. It is just the sensationalization by the media and unknown elements that, and of course, a political outcry that always surrounds it, which says that Aadhaar is comp it's not the Aadhaar that has been compromised. Let's be but very just, about But, but I, mean, I would say because the India stack actually revolves a lot of, you know, interconnecting systems, let's assume what you said happens. Aadhaar gets leaked. Let's say mobile numbers attached to that get leaked. Potentially, PAN numbers get leaked along with that. Can that be used then by by bad actors to do a lot of things? I think that's what a lot of people are concerned about. My Aadhaar numbers with somebody, my phone numbers with somebody. Now, what can they do? Let me clarify number one. I have not said that Aadhaar number has been leaked. What I have said is Aadhaar database has been leaked. What I have said is some other system which has yeah. stored some Aadhaar. Uh, my, my, you know, hundreds of information and plus the hundred and first information is my Aadhaar number. If that gets leaked, the Aadhaar does not get compromised, does not get compromised. Let me be very clear on that. So your biometrics and all in particular cannot be compromised, especially if no, you no, locked no. There, in there, is no, there is never an interchange of the biometrics with any other system. It's an Aadhaar. You, when you give your number, there's a yes and no answer that goes back. All right. Arvind, just, just hang on with me for a second. Let me get Arshdeep into this. Arshdeep. Two major accusations have been made in the last, uh, you know, few days. One, of course, uh, Arvind was explaining it's not the Aadhaar database, but, you know, the possibility that some Aadhaar numbers are out there. And B, of course, snooping charges, uh, uh, which have been made by many members of the opposition. W what, 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 what is your view on all of this? So I want to start with the fact, with the biggest of facts, the most important of fact. Why only opposition leaders in India have gotten this alert, this warning from Apple? Why does not a single BJP leader figure in that list? Is that a coincidence? Because there are many coincidences according to the BJP. Number two, I want to ask the Bharatiya Janata Party that uh, is this a first time when something of this sort has happened or there have been many before, for example, Pegasus? And uh, has there been a credible inquiry conducted into that? Have we reached to a result as to who was behind it, what happened, what transpired, and was anyone brought to justice? Did anyone have to face justice because of that? The answer to that is no again. Number three, you see, uh, Apple has no motive. Apple has nothing to gain from it. I mean, what could Apple possibly gain by saying this? And if there is no motive, there is no intention, there is no point. But who has motive? There are many states that are going into elections very soon. Many opinion polls have suggested that a certain party is losing very badly in majority of the states. Now, everybody knows it for a fact, which party could possibly have the motive, could possibly have the intention, and could possibly have precedence of uh, uh, having these sort of uh, allegations against them. So, Arshpreet, yes, you're, saying, you're saying that the <laughs> swooping that is being done is being done by state-sponsored actors here in India, not by outside, and you're specifically naming the, the, the ruling party for this. Arshpreet. See, my, my, uh, my concern here is that an inquiry should happen. I am nobody to pass a verdict. The court should decide. And uh, this should be taken as a very serious matter because only the opposition leaders are being targeted. And number two, uh, I want to ask if, if there's a BJP representative here or if anyone can speak on behalf of the Bharti Janta Party, why has uh, Apple been sent a notice and that too in such haste? I don't understand. So many incidents happened like Manipur, like Haryana. Uh, what, what not happened, but there was no haste shown in those kind of incidents. But in this... A notice has been sent ASAP as soon as possible. I want to know why. Number two, Apple did not name any party. Apple did not name any specific entity. 
then why did the center have to summon it? Please, if if anyone from the Bharatiya Janata Party would answer that or on their behalf, I'd love to hear it. And and see, it's a matter of fact that the opposition leaders have been subjected to political vendetta okay. by central agencies. And and the fact of the matter is that 95% of the cases registered by certain agencies happen to only be against opposition leaders. These are these are recorded facts on record. So right. I I think I think there is no ambiguity. There is right. no doubt doubt to the allegations, and it, they are just to be proven in the court. That's all that's left. All right, Ashfaith. Um, Arvind, of course, you're not you're not here to speak on behalf of the of the, the Bharatiya Janata Party, but the allegations of snooping in general, which we've heard about in the past, uh, specifically what's happening with Apple. I wonder if you may have a comment on that. So let me give three comments to uh, uh, our speak. Uh, again, uh, the BJP, uh, what he is talking about, the BJP, uh, um, I think um, as a Congress person, he has to talk, but I think this debate is more about the uh, more about the security issues rather than about the BJP and the Congress. But let me, at least in my view, but, uh, you know, um, here is here is certain things which are, which are clear. Apple has sent a notification to a few uh, people in India. Um, and uh, some of them happen to be opposition members. There is three things important about it, three or four things important. Let's figure it out. But, uh, uh, Ashpreet, for your knowledge, Pegasus is set up. There is no, I mean, it is, Supreme Court has done it, the expert committee didn't find Pegasus, and it's it's been settled. There has been a malware that was found, and I think, um, um, you know, I have, uh, and I, with due respect to your background, I, we have done enough work uh, to, to as, as academic researchers also, and, and and shown that Pegasus has not operated at scale in India and has not been found. So let's I'm not going to comment on that, but let's come to this Apple notification, which is the current issue. Uh, it's non-attributable. We don't know where it is. This attack, uh, this has if Apple has sent a notification has uh, originated. We don't know the timing of. We don't know when it was done. We don't know it was done yesterday, it was done a year ago, six months, so we don't know that. We don't know whether the actual data has been breached. Apple has used the word attempt to breach. Um, and thirdly, it's a worldwide alert. And lastly, there is a dubious role, and I do want to say this, uh, of access now in this, which is a, which is not a lover of democracy in India. So I'll put it there. Now the you would raise a question. Apple is legally duty bound to share this information with the Indian search All right. and Indian law. So let's not say why Apple is not a party to it. Apple is duty bound. There are lawmakers, you yourself have said, opposition members, others also, who All have right. been who have supposedly received this. So Apple is duty bound to do this. The onus lies on Apple to explain exactly what has happened. Okay. And the onus also lies on Apple to to share this information with the with the people who have been breached, so called to exactly what has been done to them. All right. I'm, I'm going to have to leave it there for the moment. One quick one line to, to you from you, Ashpreet, and I'm going to have to call it a day. I'd only say one thing. The gentleman, uh, Mr. Arvind, said that some of the opposition members have been targeted. I asked him, why is there not a single BJP leader who has figured in the list? No answer to that. All right. Um, uh, Ar Arvind, Ashpreet, thank you both so much uh, for, for joining us on, uh, with, with those viewpoints. Safety, security, of course, are really important issues, so we're going to keep on coming back to this. And Arvind will keep on also trying to understand how best the systems that are there in the India stack can actually be made more robust in, in addition to whatever is happening on the snooping controversy. Thank you both so much for joining us. And that's all we have for you on this episode of the India Story. But I have to tell you that in the middle of all of this gloom and doom, there is one piece of really, really good news that everyone is in India is continuing to focus on. And that, of course, is the performance of the Indian cricket team, which has stormed its way into the semi-final. And the team is looking really strong indeed. We're going to have more on that next week, right here on the India Story. So do remember to tune in. Bye for now.